Welcome to Twill, the week in health law, the occasional podcast of record for the discussion of health law and policy. This episode was recorded on June 19th, 2019. I'm Nicholas Terry, a professor of law at Indiana University in Indianapolis. Two excellent guests this week. Dr. Julie Cantor is an adjunct faculty member at the UCLA School of Law. She's a graduate of Stanford University, the UC Berkeley School of Law, and the Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Cantor has two decades of public policy and advocacy experience focused on federal health care policy. She's published broadly, including in the New England Journal, Annals of Internal Medicine, the Indiana Law Review, the ABA Human Rights Journal, the New York Times Debate Section, and has submitted amicus briefs in several Supreme Court cases. Ross Silverman is Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Indiana University Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health at IUPUI and holds a secondary appointment as Professor of Public Health Law at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. His research interests include legal, ethical, and policy issues in public health and medicine, mobile health law and policy, interdisciplinary curriculum development, professional school admissions, medical humanities, human rights, and patient safety. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Pleasure to be here again, Nick. So if you happen to pick up the June 5th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, you will have seen seen articles by both Julie and Ross. Ross is co-authored with uh, Douglas Opel and Saab Omar. Both articles address aspects of the current law and policy debates over vaccinations. Now, mandatory vaccine laws have a long history, as does public health law on the subject. Uh, every year, I remind my students of Justice Harlan's words in Jacobson against the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1905, quote, every well-ordered society charged with the duty of conserving the safety of its members, the rights of the individuals in respect of his liberty, may at times, under the pressure of great dangers, be subjected to such restraint to be enforced by reason reasonable regulations. So we're going to be spending much of our time discussing your articles and uh, their focus or their primary focus, which has been the measles outbreaks that we are seeing at the moment. But if I may, can we start a little more generally, a little further up in the air around 5,000 feet? Vaccines we know are safe, but that's a relative judgment and so presumably highly contextual. Um, other than the subject of today's conversation about children and the MMR vaccine, who is being vaccinated and against what in this country at the moment? As a general matter, I mean, we could look to what the American Academy of Pediatrics, and Ross, certainly you're well-versed here, um, what the Academy recommends in terms of childhood vaccinations. Um, you know, generally it covers MMR, which is measles, mumps, rubella. We also have um, hepatitis B, at least covered other also, uh, you know, other kinds of childhood um, diseases, uh, including you know polio. Uh, so I think people generally would turn to that that list to see what we're uh, vaccinating against and and why. Um, and then of course we have the flu shot every year, where people are urged to get the flu shot to at least protect against several strains of, of the flu. So yeah, I, are some vaccines just more controversial than others? I mean, I don't see social media getting all lit up when a B-list celebrity says she's not getting a flu shot. <laughs> Yes and no. I mean, there are, um, there are a lot of flavors, uh, that, uh, controversy can come in, uh, as far as, uh, vaccine debate is concerned. Uh, we tend to see cases over the last 20 years revolving around the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, most particularly because of the now withdrawn and debunked article uh, that Andrew Wakefield uh, was the lead author on that appeared in Lancet. And so that has kind of perpetuated and morphed into uh, general discussions about vaccine safety. There are also controversies that have arisen regarding other vaccines like the HPV vaccine. There are some with regard to the flu shot. There are some because of uh, hepatitis B has raised some concerns because of the 
uh, it's a sexually transmitted infection and people not wanting to have their children uh, vaccinated because they don't think their children are ever going to have sex. And then we had earlier this year, we had the controversy about the chicken pox vaccine in Kentucky, um, where people were having chicken pox parties in order to get their kids exposed to that. Um, so there are a lot of different flavors um, uh, where uh, vaccines have, have come up in controversial uh, discussions. At the same time, you know, the CDC in, in 1999 considered vaccination to be one of the greatest public health uh, achievements of the 20th century. And the amount of disease and and uh, uh, and sickness that has been uh, reduced as a result of the diffusion of vaccination is undeniable and, and, and really is an incredible uh, amount of, of improvement in health that we've seen. And I think we're against a backdrop here generally of kind of an unfortunate moment where people are having a difficult time distinguishing strong science, evidence-based science, replicable science from junk science. And that's not necessarily new. I mean, that's something that lawyers and courts have been grappling with for some time, some more successfully than others. Um, but there is that backdrop. And we also have kind of entered, as you mentioned, into an era of like what I, what other people and I call woo, whether it's celebrity woo, you know, like if you put a magnet on your head, it's going to help you with something. I mean, a, a lot of this is just really not um, evidence-based, but it, it certainly is compelling and everybody wants to live longer and live healthier. And, uh, you know, so people are kind of looking for that eternal fountain of youth in whatever form it comes in. So I think you have those two backdrops going on. Um, and then with some of these, for example, with the measles issue, not only do you have, you can separate out, well, uh, you know, if you're an unvaccinated adult and then you don't want to be vaccinated, that's one thing. But then we have the other issue of, well, what about children and how are we going to address those issues? Um, some of them were, you know, beautifully discussed in Ross's piece, um, which I'm sure we'll get to, but this idea of lowering the age of consent. So, you know, people who are in that kind of mature minor category or otherwise um, thoughtful preteens, teens who can consent to certainly some other things in medicine, why not let them consent here if they have um, parents who are really focused on um, non-evidence-based beliefs. So I think those are, you know, two issues there. So Ross, the, the public health model that lies behind uh, our current uh, vaccination uh, rules is herd immunity. Um, a simple sounding idea that I fear hides some statistical modeling. Uh, well, it does. And, you know, there are a number of different uh, aspects to it and it varies the threshold varies from infection to infection but Correct. one of the things we have to keep in mind is vaccinations are both a medical treatment uh, and a preventive treatment for an individual as well as a public health intervention what the vaccine does is not only allows for immunity to build up within an individual but it also helps to reduce the opportunity for an infection to travel through a community. And so the higher the rates of vaccination you have within a population, the lower the likelihood that uh, if the infection were to show up, that it's going to be able to spread from person to person. When we're talking about measles, it's one of the most infectious diseases known to man. And so if there were uh, 20 people in a room uh, who were unvaccinated, pretty much all of them would would uh, come down with the infection. But if you have high vaccination rates, what you need in order for measles to get herd immunity is about 95% of the population to be protected for it to, to not spread to other people. And one thing that's interesting about, well, I don't know, interesting, fairly unique about measles, and this has been noted in the popular press, so people should really already be aware of this, is that the way that just the virus behaves is that it's airborne and it can linger in the air up to two hours. So exactly what Ross is saying, not only are people in that room exposed, but then people who walk into that room an hour 
hour, 90 minutes, up to two hours later can also literally walk into the virus. And, and that's um, a concern as well, not just sort of spreading through contact, but it's just airborne lingering there. And, and that's an important concern. And then something else on the herd immunity point, which is a, a really important one to understand, but it's also important to understand who can't be vaccinated or, or who um, is less likely to have a successful response initially to the vaccine. And so in that, we're thinking about infants, we're thinking about babies, we're thinking about people who have other um, immune disorder, or not them with immune disorders, but people who have immunodeficiency types of issues. So when you're protecting, you know, you could think, well, I'm fine, I'll just be part of that 5% in the herd. Well, there are people who really need to be necessarily in the 5% for either medical reasons or just biological, physiological child development reasons. And in the outbreak areas, the recommendation is now to vaccinate um, the children who are six to 12 months, but they then need to be followed with this, the two uh, vaccinations uh, later on after they pass one year of age. And those two vaccinations do need to be 28 days apart. Um, in order to really be sure that you have as much protection as your body um, will allow. So you talked about sort of necessary exceptions. Can we now move into describing sort of the various types of state vaccination laws? I guess three sort of metrics struck me. Who do they apply to? Is it just children or adults? What are the exceptions and how are these state laws enforced? As far as the uh, who it applies to, we have set up a structure in the United States. First and foremost, our laws say that the state has the power to protect the health, welfare, and safety of its citizens um, under the police powers. And so every state's system is is slightly different. Um, second, uh, states have the authority to protect those who cannot protect themselves. And when we're talking about vaccination, what we're generally talking about are children. And so most of the laws are directed towards kids um, or adults who work in environments where there may be vulnerable populations. Like, for example, you may have some things about uh, vaccinations uh, for uh, people working in uh, um, uh, ex extended care facilities or nursing homes or things along those lines. But most of our system has revolved around children entry into school systems and entry into uh, uh, licensed daycare facilities. Uh, the requirement is that they be up to date uh, with their vaccinations in order to uh, enter into those systems. That's the general rule. But there's exemptions in many states. As Julie talked about, if you uh, have a medical condition that prevents you from being vaccinated, uh, you can apply for a medical exemption. And within the national population, it's generally about 0.3 to 0.5 percent of the population of kids uh, nationally are getting these medical exemptions. Many states have allowed, uh, in, in trying to balance the individual rights versus the public health protection uh, in, in that uh, in trying to titer that correctly, they have allowed for certain types of exemptions based on beliefs. Uh, a, a, a decreasing number of states, but uh, I think it's now 45 states allow a religious exemption uh, for from vaccination and about 15 states allow a philosophical exemption for, so which could mean pretty much any reason at all that you would not want to have your children uh, vaccinated and what we're finding is that states that have these broader exemptions are having significantly higher numbers of families that are opting out of vaccination these days just a couple of things to note there one thing that was interesting and this is the subject of the um, legislation going on in California right now, this Senate Bill 276, which is sort of adding a, a layer of oversight to our medical exemption here. I'm in California, so that's why I'm saying our. 
Um, so California used to have that religious uh, philosophical exemption, and then it was rescinded by the legislature after the Disneyland um, outbreak. I believe it was in 2015, a measles outbreak there, um, and people being concerned that we've kind of gone too far with this idea, this leeway, and we needed to um, set a different boundary. So there continues to be a medical exemption. But what was what researchers found um, and published a piece on this was that the number of those philosophical and religious exemptions seem to be folded in subsequent years into now a medical exemption. In, in other words, the rate of medical exemptions increased by the rate that uh, the religious slash philosophical exemptions decreased. And so people thought that was very interesting, if not concerning, and wanted to have some oversight there to be sure that those medical exemptions were really, truly um, necessary uh, and, and based in science, not based in people who, you you know, who were sympathetic to a cause and happened to be doctors and could kind of do an end run around around that law. So the uh, the 2015 outbreak in California that you alluded to, which uh, I think that led to Senate Bill 277, which uh, eliminated Correct. the personal beliefs exemption, and yes. and that was uh, that was upheld by by the courts. Um, that that struck me um, as sort of a, a tennis club problem, right, or a, a, a spa population issue of um, upper middle class parents um, uh, exhibiting acute interest in um, libertarianism. The more recent flare-ups we've seen, uh, Ross, uh, you mentioned um, uh, earlier when we spoke, uh, the Minnesota Somali community and then most recently the Orthodox communities in New York. Um, is there any evidence that these religious groups have particular medical or other issues for which the medical exemption would be something of a surrogate, if you like? Short answer is no. <laughs> the, uh, the longer answer is uh, what we see with these outbreaks. Uh, what's consistent across all of them is that the uptake of vaccination is is high nationwide. In fact, it's never really been higher. The problem we run into is that communities of beliefs, whether it be those that you kind of described, the tennis club kind of environment that you described uh, earlier, or within a particular, within the Somali community in Minnesota, or within these ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish communities in New York, uh, you have these clustered exemptions uh, that create these vulnerable hotspots. And what we found uh, and what has been seen in these communities, uh, similarly uh, with an Amish community uh, where there was an outbreak a few years ago in uh, rural Ohio, is that a belief takes hold uh, within these communities. Sometimes it is uh, prodded along by uh, anti-vaccination, uh, at, at essentially people who are coming into these communities to foment distrust of vaccination. And within the Somali community, there's been a very strong belief about the connection between MMR and autism. Within the Orthodox community in New York City, there's been a significant concern about this being some sort of a population control concern, um, as well as risks related to vaccination injuries. And even during these outbreaks, these anti-vaccination groups have been going back into New York uh, into these communities uh, and holding meetings in order to say they're out to get you they're trying to uh, they're trying to brainwash you they're trying to eliminate uh, eliminate you from the community fomenting this distrust fomenting a disbelief about the science and the safety of vaccination one thing that you say that occurs to me is if you're really tr I mean I'm not a conspiracy theorist but if you're gonna buy into the idea that people are out to get you I mean you could make the same argument for not consenting to vaccination that you know that now you're vulnerable to this disease and these 
these diseases, you know, are not remotely benign. So, uh, you know, it's just it's just kind of interesting which version of the conspiracy theory, you know, people um, buy into. Uh, but on the religious issue point, I do think it's interesting that people have and, and one of the recent cases I mentioned in my articles from the Second Circuit, it's a really interesting opinion, really well, well written, very clear and very thorough um, and, and harkens back, Nick, to the case that you mentioned at the top, the, the Jacobson case, um, in talking about that through line of constitutional law. Two things. One is that the the majority of cases on whether these religious exemption um, statutes, if, if a state declines to have one or removes it from its statutes, if, if it's run afoul of the First Amendment, the, the majority opinions tend to, the majority of opinions really say that they're, you do, you you don't have a First Amendment right to a religious exemption. So if a state wants to go kind of out of its way and say, oh, in our state, we are going to recognize this kind of extra piece for you, it's welcome to do that. But it certainly doesn't have to under the Constitution, according to the vast majority of courts that have weighed in on, on that matter. And another thing on the religious exemption issue that's interesting, because now people are sort of saying, well, I don't want my medical exemption to be vetted. But in some states, certainly New York, these religious exemptions have have indeed been vetted, and people who have at least gotten to the level of suing um, when their religious exemption was not recognized have had to undergo cross-examination and really shore up that their belief in New York, for example, was based in religion and not a personal philosophy because of the way that their statute was written. So, it, you know, it is interesting that there is some vetting going on on, on these various exemptions, but I think, you know, you're going to see, um, as we've now seen in New York, a ratcheting down because it seems to have gotten a, a bit um, out of hand and especially in communities where people are um, clustering and it doesn't even necessarily need to be in a religious community um, as you were mentioning Nick with that your kind of tennis club analogy that it can be people who come together for different reasons um, the Waldorf school at issue in Rockland County comes to mind for me that that's not a particularly religious issue um, but it, it does have people who are um, uh, drawn together for, you know, certain other kinds of reasons, and their vaccination rate tends to be quite low. Um, and, and then just one other point to go back to this issue of what can we, you know, what, what should be done about this. Um, and I think that Professor Michael Wilrich, he wrote an article in 2011, an op-ed in the New York Times, it was really prescient, because he talks about the public health risk of this kind of paranoia and these deep seated concerns that go back, you know, probably over 100 years, certainly to the smallpox era, um, and that officials really need to understand that people who are making policy. And I would say that not only do they need to have a historical understanding um, and a scientific understanding of what people are concerned about, but they also have to have an emotionally intelligent piece where their policy is really going to resonate with people, that they're going to go out there, not only sort of from door to door, from town to town, um, but they're going to be able to disseminate information in a way that is thoughtful, scientific, that's non-judgmental, and that really brings people to the table because it's sharing helpful information. Pam Bellock and Reed Abelson had a really nice piece in the Times yesterday where they went through sort of the vaccine safety numbers and did a sort of a risk-benefit analysis compared to those who had any kind of uh, reaction to uh, vaccinations. And, and the numbers are quite compelling, but I'm less sure about how you actually get that over to people, particularly uh, those who, you know, are susceptible to, to buying the fake news. Yeah, and I mean, we're all susceptible to it on, on some level. And I think that, you know, the one concern is when, if we get to a place of panic, that we become, you know, really anxious. And then I think public policy and even law can take a really problematic turn if you kind of look back historically. So we, we certainly don't want to get to a place of panic. And one example that happened with um, the Brooklyn community was that folks in the community were organizing and, and recently organized almost I could describe it as like a tabling event where it was really geared toward the moms because uh, moms are making decisions. It could be geared toward parents, but in this community, it was geared toward the moms. 
and they invited、uh, people to come, and they set up tables where each table had a particular issue or a question or a rumor or a myth, and then you could come to the table and speak to a doctor and a nurse and others who had、um, information to share with you to discuss the myth and get information that perpetuated the myth and how did it, how did it come about? Where did it come from? And then information that would undermine it and help. Educate people about、um, what's not junk, but what's actually evidence-based、um, science. So that was one thing that seemed to be. It's kind of that the what I what I mentioned in my piece about the, this Brooklyn Nurses Association, literally going kind of house to house, living room to living room, and just really talking to people and saying what what is happening、um, here, what are your concerns, and let's address them and let's talk through some of these issues and and where something may have spun from fact to myth and and really. Get at that, not in a way like I said it yesterday, and I'm disavowing that I say it today, but in a way that you know, if you play telephone, things have a way of spinning out of control over time. And one person historically, and this is what Professor Wilrich、uh, mentioned both in his op-ed piece and also in the book that he wrote about smallpox, Dr. Wharton Baker, who worked in the public health field at the time of smallpox and the vaccine and, and those early、um, 1900s, and would really go town to town and explain to people. What the issues were, and what the if if there was、um, a concern, what the concern was, and according to Professor Wilrich, by the end of his talk, a lot of people were rolling up their sleeves and saying, "Please vaccinate me." So I, I think there is work to be done here, and I think it has to be.、Um, you have to believe in people; they have to have influence. You have to have an emotionally intelligent piece of it, and it has to come across as very non-threatening,、um, but very reliable. Is there a problem here of you know? A generation or two of us who have not experienced the underlying disease. I mean, I saw a terrific interview with Melinda Gates of the Gates Foundation on Netflix the other night, in which she talked about the near eradication of polio.、Uh, you know, in 1988 or so, the polio virus was in 125 countries and paralyzed some 350,000. Uh, kids per year today, it's ninety nine percent gone. It would be a hundred percent gone if they could get into a couple of war zones, and there weren't too many sort of libertarian objections raised to that. I'm of the age that I was born after the polio vaccine, but before MMR. And as a child, I remember having measles, mumps, and rubella. But there is an entire generation or two that have never seen that. So the the risk factors don't seem perhaps as obvious. I think that's I think that's definitely true. I think it does contribute. It's not the entirety of the of the problem, but I I do think that having that absent from society has been a contribution to this issue. I mean, if we, on the other hand, look at what's going on in New York City, Brooklyn just a couple years ago had another large. These same communities had another large outbreak、uh, in 2013. There were 58 measles cases in the Brooklyn Orthodox community, and at that time, that was the single largest measles outbreak in the United States since 1996.、Uh, and so, on the one hand, familiar or or the lack of familiarity、uh, has. Has, has maybe gotten some people's、uh, defenses down, and they're starting to focus more on the risks of introducing、uh, a potential risk to their child versus the risk of these diseases. At the same time, we're seeing within some of these other communities、uh, that even having been exposed to the risk,、uh, we're still seeing some significant resistance. So I do think, as Julie mentioned, maximizing、uh, the Uh, opportunity and the funding and the reimbursement、uh, for health providers to have the time to have conversations and answer questions in a way that's going to resonate with the population that they're serving is is critically important. And that's that's really, I mean, underlying a lot of this is the fact that our healthcare system doesn't allow for people to have a forty five minute conversation and have all their concerns answered, at least without putting. Pressure on the on the providers、uh, in other ways, and, and that's what people really see as best practice is this you know building a relationship over time, and and certainly there 
discussions from pediatricians who've practiced in this area who can tell you about families that have been sort of in their view brought around to vaccination and how long it took. And the CDC and people who are, are in this field definitely talk about this issue of trust and patience and information um, and that those are critical. And then Nick, you know, kind of getting back to your point and building on Ross, what you just said, it seems to me that if you have an outbreak of, say, 58 cases, that that's, you know, concerning, but it's not at the levels like the thousands, hundreds of thousands, where you're really sort of from a population statistics point of view going to see the real horror shows necessarily. Um, and people who are, you know, I don't know, it, it can take in some cases five to seven years for uh, the particular encephalopathy that's been associated with measles to develop. And so it's hard to say that, well, I've seen measles, I, I see how bad it is, because it's not like, you know, the 1950s, where it was, you know, millions of, of cases, or even now overseas in countries where they are having really significant outbreaks, and you see a whole panoply of sequelae, it could be like, well, you know, Know, the, that family or that whole block had measles and everybody was fine. So it, it could actually serve to ricochet and kind of undermine the point because it didn't seem so bad. But the I think that issue would be, well, that's because the population numbers weren't there. Um, and if you have a death rate of one to two per thousand, you're going to need, you know, more than 58 cases to have these horrible sequelae kind of kick in, so to speak. Um, so just to, you know, Ross, just shoring up your point is that you could argue, well, we should really be looking at these communities and other um, nations where they are grappling with measles, for example, at the rates of tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands. But I'm not even sure there are some data on this or some research where people have said, well, if I show people pictures of how horrible, for example, measles is, does that change minds? And it, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to. Um, so it's kind of unclear how that would be. Um, although I think perhaps if you and your family have family lore um, that really suggests the horror of a particular disease, for example, I grew up hearing about how my great grandmother died from strep throat. So, it, you know, so I, I was particularly attuned to that issue. So so perhaps if you have some kind of like a community history or some institutional family knowledge on on that, that may have some particular resonance with a with a disease and may help people understand the benefits of vaccination. You mentioned trust, Julie, and there does appear to be some reduction in trust with regard to our public health system and indeed to our health care systems. Um, now, is, is are the vaccination issues causing the reduction in trust or is there a lack of trust in public health and health care that is uh, causing some of the pushback against vaccination? I mean, I think there's a parallel here to the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate, um, you know, where we tried to make people um, eat broccoli. We we try to persuade people they should do something they don't want to do in order to guard against future harm. And that's sort of the crux here, isn't it, of of prevention, spending on prevention rather than on treatment. Uh, Angela Shen had a nice piece in Health Affairs this month on uh, the return on investment of vaccination. And if you think about it, uh, both vaccination and, and buying health insurance requires a sort of a, a, a belief or a buy-in to solidarity, which is sort of something that is, is strongly resisted by many in the United States. Oh, I mean, certainly, aren't we the like the country of, you know, individual liberty and pulling yourself up by the bootstraps? I mean, we, we certainly have this history of rugged individualism. Um, so I do think that's that's there. And then, you know, it's also that kind of question of um, what are we going to spend our public money on and what can we get people to um, understand in terms of preparing for a future and people who have access to health insurance but say, well, I don't need it because I'm not going to get sick. Um, you know, that really understanding that things can go south in a hurry uh, and that you really do need to insure against harms and protect yourself against that. And, and that could be certainly, as you're mentioning, you know, cultural issue. And that's really hard to unpack, 
I think. And that's been, I think, a big challenge. You mentioned solidarity. I think there has been a loss of that sense that any decisions that I personally make might have an impact on the person standing next to me. And I think we see this a lot with the vaccine issue. And, and you know, to the point where when we're hearing from legislators uh, who are trying to roll back public health protections and maybe even expand exemptions, the language they're using uh, seems to discount that there is any right to have any infringement whatsoever on individual liberties, which is, I mean, in some ways, I mean, that's, you know, pre-constitutional. I mean, this is like, you know, the Leviathan kind of situations here where it is the law of nature rather than uh, us living within a community of laws. And I, that's, for me, me, one of the biggest concerns about uh, this current debate is we're having it with within certain populations, we're having this conversation where they believe that no restriction on individuals is appropriate, even if these consequences can be scientifically demonstrated that if you, if you continue to reduce the protections, we're going to see significant numbers of people uh, harmed. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we all have to live within a community. We all have to, you know, abide by basic traffic laws. And I think wear seatbelts because that's actually good for you, even if it's not necessarily going to affect somebody else. But then when you get into an accident and we all have to pay your health care costs, that that will ostensibly decrease them. And yeah, I mean, I do think that there it's on a continuum of, you know, wild individualism to everything's community. And we have to kind of figure out the right um, balance there. But Nick, I wanted to go back to your point on trust. And I think one thing that's really concerning in the current outbreak situations that I noticed is that if you're coming from if you're coming from a baseline of questionable trust, like some people don't trust the medical community generally, some people don't trust the government generally. Uh, and you could have a conversation about that, you know, beyond this one, certainly. But even if you're coming from a baseline of trust, missteps really don't help. And there were a couple of things that happened um, in New York, and it's really not to pick on New York, but it's just to say that this is where they had the most cases. So this is where the most policy activity has been. Uh, you know, two things come to mind. One, on the New York City level, they had this mandatory vaccination order. And, you know, some people were saying, well, couldn't they have given us a heads up about this? It seemed to come from nowhere, according to some people. Um, and also the idea that they announced it with criminal penalties, as well as civil penalties, and then rolled that back. And it didn't seem to me to be a strategic play. Like we'll go out with criminal penalties and then we'll get rid of them. And that'll, that'll make us, you know, seem like we're really negotiating. It didn't strike me as that. It just struck me as kind of a misstep. I think that doesn't help shore up the trust point. Um, and then just even on the kind of micro level, CNN reported that there were door tag, like door hang things that you hang on a door to have information that New York state put out in these particular Brooklyn communities. And they had them translate translated from English to Yiddish, but the Yiddish translation was so terrible that in some instances it was either meaningless or almost laughable. And so that kind of inability to run things to ground um, as you would do in, you know, sort of the private sector or you'll, your client will fire you in short order. Uh, those things don't help shore up trust. Um, or if you have trust, it's going to, you know, diminish it. So I think those kinds of, they almost seem like just um, sort of negligent types of missteps, like things that you could be really thoughtful about that you really need to focus on on there because you're coming from a position where trust is so important. That said, one of the things that was challenging, I think, about the New York City case, in addition to the fact that this was a, in some ways, a repeat of what had happened five years before, was that this was was an incremental step in their trying to manage this outbreak. And it had been a part of a process that had had continual communication within that community. I mean, the, the outbreak had started back in the fall, and they began by excluding unvaccinated children from schools in December. Then in January,
January, one of the schools went out of compliance, allowed a kid who was infected with measles to come back to school. Uh, that led to the uh, another uh, at least 28 cases to be spread in that community. Then in March, another five schools allowed unvaccinated kids back into school. And so they ended up having to take steps in order to address that. Uh, and then in April, they came out with uh, with this uh, with with this fine system and with the uh, the threat of of mandatory vaccination. So it's uh, you know it's it's one of those situations that if, if I'm sitting in the in the in the seat of the public health department, you know there is a bend but don't break philosophy. You don't need to have 100% adherence to the recommendation for vaccination. At the same time, when you have persistent violation of the recommendations in these circumstances. There really aren't that many other, you know, arrows in the quiver for the for the state uh, to use in those circumstances. And, and that's really important. I think the question is exactly what you're saying. Like, what are the the options? And the city has now been um, closing those at issue schools, at least temporarily, until they can come up with a written program about how they're going to correct uh, their behavior and what their next steps will be. Um, and so. T- Certainly, they've been taking, you know, those kinds of of steps. Um, It was interesting looking at the recording of the Board of Health meeting on the 17th, April 17th, the New York Board of Health meeting. And watching a bit of, well, I watched the whole discussion of this, you know, it did strike me that they, you know, people, of course, people really do want good outcomes here and they want to do what's best for public health and they want to do what's best for the community. And there was a palpable frustration feeling like, Ross, as you're saying, we just don't have enough arrows in the quiver. And my question would be, well, really, do we? Um, And maybe if we present even as a think exercise at this, at these board meetings, opposing viewpoints, uh, or other ideas, um, maybe that would be helpful. For example, the one that I mentioned with this, you know, tabling, um, could that have been going on? The supporting financially the efforts of the Brooklyn nurses, which seem to have, uh, at least anecdotally, some effect. And what struck me at that meeting was that there was a, um, a really interesting presentation from a member of the health department. And it would have been, I think, useful to have, um, you know, and again, you don't have to believe in it, but just almost as an argument, have an opposing viewpoint and say, here are the concerns, here are the dangers, and, and kind of run to ground a bit. What's going to happen if um, this particular policy, you know, fails? And is it worth the risks? So I was I was struck by the danger of, um, I don't think it was at the level of groupthink, but the, the danger of not having opposing viewpoints and being able to really tease out what some additional options would be, uh, and then, you know, present a timeline for those or shore up some establish some data points on those um, as opposed to, well, we got to throw more stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, But, you know, to be fair, they are in a bit of a crisis situation. And as I mentioned in the piece, I think this kind of like a panicked situation is not a particularly strong one in which to make public policy or law. And the key now is, especially because we can predict these hotspots, there was uh, the paper that came out in one of the, I believe, one of the adjunct Lancet journals talking about the proximity of international airports to communities where vaccination rates were low and predicting those as the next hotspots. People in these fields um, would be really well served to come up with best practices now and start rolling them out. And and obviously some of these, uh, for example, rescinding the religious exemptions, I think are an attempt to do that, but really focusing on, well, we don't have a hot, an outbreak, but we do have a potential hotspot. How are we going to address that now? Um, because, for example, like, you know, the Will Rich article that I mentioned was written in 2011. So some of these, you know, these things are um, predictable. And the key is w- what can we learn and what can we do better in the future and how can we start now? And that from a public health perspective, that's a lesson public health does need to learn that they need to be working with the local legislatures and talking to them in times of of quiet about public health and become trusted resources for them with regard to uh, how policies should be structured and shaped. The time of crisis is not 
the time to to ideally to be uh, passing uh, these kinds of laws. And so that is something public health has to kind of relearn is uh, how to be that go to resource for legislators when they say, hey, you know, I'm hearing some concerns about this or some people have uh, said they're worried about these uh, these issues that they turn to the public health rather than some other voices on on how to address these issues. And on that positive note, that was the Week in Health Law. A big thank you to Dr. Cantor and Professor Silverman uh, for joining me. Uh, you can find Julie at juliecantor.com. And Ross is at PHLU on Twitter. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, thanks again, Nick. Well, it was great fun. Thank you so much. Show notes are at twill.com. I am at Nicholas Terry on Twitter. Thank you for joining me and have a legally interesting but healthy week.